Good morning, mummies. Good morning, mummies on the call. Good morning, mummies, wherever you're watching us, even if you're watching the recording. And good morning, my good friend, my Philly. Hello. Good morning. So nice to have you. So this morning we have Dr. Maithili Pandey with us. She's a family physician. She's also an IBCLC, which stands for Internationally Board Certified International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. And that well is the, the highest qualification in breastfeeding that you can get, isn't it? Yes. And she's also the owner of Mother and Child, um, which is our only really lactation center in Singapore, but you are making it into so much more. And I'd like you to take just two minutes maybe to talk about everything that you offer at Tanglin Mall um, so that people can know where to find you and what you offer. And you have so many exciting new projects that, that I'm really happy about. Cool. So Mother and Child has been around in Singapore for the last 30 years. And I have been handed over the reins over the last six, seven months now. And it has been such an exciting project. So Mother and Child has been an institution in Singapore and it takes a mother, her partner and her baby in her womb all the way from childbirth education to hypnobirthing, active birthing, pre-lactation consult and then a lactation consult. And then later on, we have parenting classes. You've got nanny classes that I'll share about as well. Uh, first aid for moms and parents, first aid for helpers, music and movement, and so much more. Like, you know, it is really an institution. It is there for the mother and for the child and for the family as well. And, and that's what I've, I've been trying to create and, and build upon as well. Amazing. That's so great. It's, it's, it's a lot of offering and use in such a brilliant central location as well as at Tanglin Mall. You know, it's really easy to get to, really easy to get into your clinic. Um, all the facilities are there. So anyway, seek them out. Um, highly encourage you to do that. And because breastfeeding is always the number one topic that we get a lot of interest for, um, I want to go right into it, actually. And so, mummies, this is just a Q&A. Maithili and I haven't really prepared anything because we know that you have lots of questions and we want them answered. So please let us know by either raising your hand or putting it in the chat. I'm happy to read it out. You don't have to speak up if you can't. Maybe you're feeding or maybe you're in a, you know, at work or wherever you're watching us. So uh, just put it in the chat and we'll ask um, Maithili about it and she will answer you directly. Um. I will start off with a first question if there's no, uh, um, while we're waiting for uh, questions to come in. Um, and this is, I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit about NICU babies. So these mamas ending up with a baby in NICU, maybe because they're very premature. I had a client recently had babies um, at week in, in, in weeks 32 or 33. So these, mm. Babies obviously need support, but I feel that the moms are very unsupported. And then that that often breastfeeding is not going so great because they don't know what to do and how to prepare and, and how, how to get their milk supply started and how to feed the babies that milk and so on and so on. So can you talk about this special scenario a little bit for us? Absolutely. So, I mean, I think while the baby is still in the womb, mothers are very well cared for by the obstetricians and the nursing. But once baby's out, sometimes it, they're left like not knowing where to go and how to help themselves. A lot of care is given to the baby and that they're really appreciative of. But what then happens to the mama? What happens to her milk supply? What happens to her breasts, right? So um, I think especially during the December period where a lot of people were out of town, um, mm -hmm. lactation support might have been in short supply. I think moms might not have been very well supported at that point in time. But what I think is really important is that moms get to know and they're educated about how breastfeeding starts up and then they can be empowered to ask questions. And, and you know, if they were placed in that scenario where babies then, you know, out early, then they can start and advocate for themselves what they need and, and how to get started. One of the most important things I find is a pre-lactation consult. And a pre-lactation consult is a lactation consult before the baby arrives. 
Yeah. So we're talking about how to get started, what you can do when you are separated from your baby. So for instance, if your baby needs to go to SCN or NICU, and maybe you have had to step away from the baby for whatever reason, how then can we make sure that the milk supply is starting to get established? We're pumping, we're producing something, whether it's colostrum transitional milk, or actually mature milk for that baby so that your milk supply is protected as well as the baby is also protected. Because mm -hmm. we know that breast milk in the first couple of days are chock a block with all these beautiful immunoglobulins and we want that transferred into your baby. It's their very first vaccination that your baby receives before the VCG, before the hepatitis B. Mm -hmm. That's really good to know. I find that it's very tricky for mommies to get enough access into NICU. I do find that the public hospitals are a little bit better at that than the private for whatever reason. Um, but it's really hard when you have to go back and forth between hospital and at home. And so what is your advice? How does a mom with with who doesn't have her baby with her, how does she establish a milk supply? I think one of the things that moms forget is that they can actually request to stay in the hospital. So pay for the hospital room or a bed so that she stays in hospital. And so whenever she needs to transport that milk, she can then do that from the hospital bed to the baby, right? And that's one way to do it. But um, we must remember that milk, your milk production is directly proportional to milk removal. Mm -hmm. So if the baby is for, for whatever reason separated from the mother, the mother needs to start using a breast pump. Hand expression is not going to work. Hand expression is great for collecting those really sticky drops of colostrum, but that stimulation that comes from something suckling on the breast actually really needs to happen right from the very start. Mm -hmm. So hand expression, collecting the colostrum, and then stimulating the milk supply Okay, with the breast pump. That actually brings me to something else because we have a lot of moms uh, who may be having a C-section um, for whatever reason. Um, we have actually, yeah, a lot of them already know. We have had so many breach presentations lately as well where moms chose to have a C-section and and other instances as well so if i know that i'm going to have to go through a surgical birth um and i don't necessarily have access to my, my body doesn't know that it's birthing so the hormones are a little bit disrupted aren't they and so um are you a proponent of these moms um uh, colostrum to do colostrum harvesting before the baby is born <laughs> When do I start? How is it done safely? A lot of doctors will actually say, oh, but this could stimulate contractions. So that's not what we want. Uh, mm. What is your take on that? So high risk pregnancies, we, like, you know, if there has been a cervical surclage, and if you don't know what it is, you probably don't need to know what it is. <laughs> um, if you have had... <laughs> If you have had like an IVF or, you know, late term miscarriages and all of those sorts of pretty high risk issues, I would say maybe listen to your doctors and, and do not colostrum harvest. But for most other mothers, it's perfectly fine to colostrum harvest in the later part of the pregnancy. So we're talking about 37, 38, even 39 weeks, mm -hmm. um, 36 weeks might be a little bit too early. So the risk here is that when we stimulate, can you see this? When we stimulate the areola and the nipple, what tends to happen is you're producing small amounts of this hormone called oxytocin. And oxytocin is the same hormone that we actually artificially inject into a mother when we're doing an induction or augmentation of the labor. So that hormone can and has the potential to stimulate contractions only if the uterus is primed and ready to give birth. Mm -hmm. So for that to happen, the body needs to kind of get ready, it needs to get psyched, then the oxytocin receptors get implanted in the womb, and then, only then, will the oxytocin that is free-flowing with stimulation will then cause a contraction. That tends to not happen in the earlier part of pregnancy, and it certainly doesn't happen before week that is for, for most mothers. But in small case of uh, mothers, sometimes when we do some stimulation on the nipple and the areola, it can trigger some contractions. So in, that, in those cases, if you find that, hey, I'm getting some cramps, I don't feel quite right, then I would say stop and don't stimulate any further. 
by and large, for most mothers, when they do a little bit of colostrum harvesting, it does not stimulate contractions. And besides, after 37 and a half weeks, you know, your already baby's pretty much fully formed and we can actually start to collect some colostrum. Colostrum harvesting is one excellent way of it producing something for the baby before they're even born so that it acts as a backup for the baby in case they needed any kind of intervention and they're separated from you in the hospital. So this is a really good way to have a backup, right? But it also provides that mother with a great sense of achievement and even confidence when they say, okay, I know I'm producing some colostrum. I now know that when my baby suckles, I am going to be producing something for the baby. And that's a huge thing for a lot of moms. When you know you have a baby who's like upset with you, crying all the time, suckling, and you're never sure what the baby's actually transferring. If we know that we actually have some colostrum in our breasts and we are producing it for our baby, that's a huge tick in their favor. That's amazing. And that's a, a real, another thing is to learn a skill without there being a crying baby. So you sort of, um, you, you learn something that you will definitely 100% need in the first week of your baby's life. I always find that this hand expression can be a little bit tricky for some moms to learn. So um, what do you have to say for those moms that, that find that they're not actually very successful in harvesting any colostrum before and they can be a little bit disappointed uh, because there's nothing coming out could that send the wrong message <laughs> what do, what do you think because I, what I always say is this is not about actually collecting the milk this is more about you learning the skill about priming your body about preparing for breastfeeding absolutely look I mean I say this to my moms in a consult but I'm going to say it over here okay it's like taking a poop um and it doesn't happen when you're stressed and if there's someone knocking on the door, right? Like you actually need to be relaxed and then just en envisioning things and rivers of milk and fluffy clouds and, you know, that sort of thing. Like you actually need to be relaxed for something to be coming out of the breast. Um, it's it effectively ejaculation from the breast, isn't it? <laughs> so we need warm hands. We need to kind of really just massage we can't be causing our breast too much pain so it's really about pushing into the areola and pressing down very gently it's not meant to be painful it can be a little bit uncomfortable at the beginning but you kind of get used to it anyway um and and that's basically it so don't get stressed if you're not collecting anything because um it is a learned skill it doesn't just come naturally to a lot of us yeah amazing Mummies, please give us your questions in the chat uh, because Mycelia and I have a tendency to just ramble on and on and on. So if you want to uh, have your questions answered, um, let us know. In the meantime, I have some um, that I got in via WhatsApp earlier. So I'll read those to you. So one is um, nursing to sleep. We're often being told that that is a bad habit. Don't do it. What is your What are your thoughts? Oh, this is super contentious, but I actually believe that that's what nature's always intended for us to do. You know, babies and us mummies, when we are breastfeeding, we release a huge barrage of hormones that kind of put us into the state of almost bliss, right? We want, we almost feel sleepy every time you have a baby on your chest and suckling. It's It's got to do with your baby's hormones. It's got to do with the... Uh, these cytokines that are produced by the baby's gut, it's got to do with this whole, like just relaxation as soon as you're re releasing some milk on the breast. So it is quite normal and really natural to be able to have your baby in your arms and drift off to sleep. And as, you, as your baby falls off to sleep, you tend to fall off to sleep and this is perfect and fine. What we tend to worry about is if babies are suckling but not actually transferring milk. Mm -hmm. that's a different story but I think where you're coming from the question that you're asking is really about is it a bad habit to have your baby on your breast to sleep I don't think it is I think that's natural and that's what we want babies to do um, it's like having a nice buffet meal and then you take a big yawn and you might just doze off on the sofa after your buffet meal and that's exactly what it is your baby's had a good meal they want to fall asleep and that's perfectly fine they feel safe they feel 
confident that you're going to be there looking after them. They're going to feel loved. They feel secure. And, and that's perfectly normal. Mm. That brings me to something else. I mean, feeding on the sofa and all of that and falling asleep. Mm. There are a lot about safe um, breastfeed. Uh, sorry, safe co-sleeping guidelines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, can you talk a little bit about that? How to set yourself up safely to, um, yeah. Absolutely. So it's called the Safe Sleep 7. Um, and there are seven pointers that we need to have fulfilled before we can talk about safely co-sleeping in bed. Not on a sofa, not on a couch that has got deep pockets on either side where your baby can kind of like get suffocated in. Um, we want a bed that doesn't have lots of soft fabric, soft pillows, things that could potentially fall onto her, him, mm -hmm. and suffocate, right? So we want to make sure that both parents are non-smokers because smoking does affect the airways of the child and it can cause some blockages and, and things like that. But a baby who is 100% breastfed and ideally breastfed at the breast, so no bottles, no supplemental nursing, nothing else of that sort, no, no formula. One of the reasons behind that is because there is quite a high risk of overfeeding and then aspiration. So it, the milk actually going into the airways, and it can cause you know some kind of suffocation in that baby who has been fed artificial means as well. So that's a no no. Um, then other things like we need a well baby, so not a baby who's been unwell. We want a well baby to be sleeping with the mother. And there are quite a few others. Oh, no, swaddles, very important. I'm not a huge fan mm -hmm. of swaddles at all because I find that when a baby has um, movement in their hands, they can walk things away out of their yes. airways as well. And that's important too. So no swaddles. Um, I often have to fight with confinement nannies about this because I find that confinement nannies love swaddling the baby, especially at night. And that's a huge suffocation risk. Um off the top of my head, I can't think of the other few, but um, I can send you an infographic and then oh, that, that might nice help. to share that. Okay, I see we have some questions uh, that have come in. So let's go to those first and then return mm -hmm. to the answer. Okay, so one is breastfeeding and sleep. This mom has three kids, um, ages three, uh, sorry, six, three, and seven and a half months. I breastfed the first two two for two and a two hour, uh, sorry two years and three months each. We didn't do any sleep training whatsoever, and they only started sleeping through the night after I weaned. For this last baby, I would love to breastfeed for as long as possible, but I also need my sleep because I'm just so tired and plan to go back to work. So my question is, do I need to wean or sleep train to get sleep, or how do I know that if they're suckling just for comfort but not actually getting milk, which is what you said earlier? Mm -hmm. How, how do I tell the difference? Look, um, comfort and milk in the mouth is actually one and the same, I find. But what we do find that some... Okay, so let me let me address that question first and then talk about weeding, okay? So in the early days when babies are sucking, the only way of actually knowing milk is being transferred is if you hear a, a swallow, right? Um, so you actually have to hear the gluc, gluc sounds as the baby's swallowing milk. And that's important that's evidence of milk being transferred. Of course, in the grand scheme of things, we can count the number of nappies, the number of poos, and things like that. But immediately, as the baby's on the breast, we want to see suckles mm -hmm. and hear the swallows. And that's the important bit. Yeah. And that's evidence, okay? Um, babies will suckle for comfort, and that's perfectly fine. They have been suckling on their fingers, their toes, their umbilical cord in the womb, and they will continue to want to suckle on something for comfort. It's like a hug, you know, suckling a breast. And the good thing about suckling on the breast is that if there is some nutrition coming through the breast, then they're getting some additional bits of food in their bodies instead of using a pacifier, which doesn't give them or confer any benefits whatsoever. So, that's about comfort latching. Um, yes, they will comfort latch in the middle of the night because if you think about it, humankind in the caveman days, I suppose, um, if the babies are not with their mothers, they will be likely eaten by a dinosaur or a, a werewolf or whatever, right? Like it, it's, that's always a possibility. So babies are meant to be sleeping close to their mothers and they will comfort because that's how they get really close with the mom. 
Okay. And, and that's perfectly fine. Okay. Now let's talk about sleeping, weaning and um, sleep training, I suppose. So when babies are sleeping at night and they're latched on, what they tend to do is sometimes they're actually collecting what they need from their moms, but have not been able to do it while they were separated from their moms, or they were busy playing or watching their siblings running around. I find this happens typically in baby number two and three and up, right? Because yeah. they're busy. They're, they're just watching, they're listening. They might not be taking what they need during the day, but they will catch up with that at night where everything is cool quiet and dark and there's nothing to look at so yes it might be the case in in your case is that Waylin? Yeah? yes that was a question from Waylin. so actually you don't really need i mean look it is tricky isn't it that sleep my suggestion would be to think about maybe safely co-sleeping with your baby when you're co-sleeping a lot of moms actually don't fully wake up mm -hmm in the middle of the night to, to feed their baby. So they just pull the baby to them, feed off, and then, you know, baby goes back into the co-sleeper or beside them, right? And that usually works quite well. I find it harder for mothers who need to get out of bed and pat the baby back to sleep and then go back into their own bed to sleep because that actually re requires um, you stepping up stepping out of bed and then getting to your baby, finding the baby and then patting them back to sleep again. Uh, we call it sleep reversal. How quickly can you get back to sleep as a function of how much sleep you effectively get during the night? I can go on and on about this, can't I? <laughs> yeah, so that would be something for you to think about. Like, So mm -hmm. do you really need to wean to, to get that sleep? I don't know. It is a tricky question, isn't it? Um, we might have to have a chat about this, Lynn. <laughs> Just, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is such a such an important topic anyway. Um, we, we think a lactation consultant is only useful, you know, in the first few weeks to get breastfeeding established and, and iron out any, you know, um, issues that there may be. But really, another big step is the going back to work. And how do I make this work with pumping and um, and transporting milk and I don't know what. So uh, there are so many different um, times in your breastfeeding journey where you might benefit from the help of my city and her beautiful lactation consultants. Um, next questions, though. Due to some complications, I'm advised not to give my baby my milk. If I can if I continue him on the breast for long, he will lose weight. He's three weeks old, and from the last for the last twelve days, he's been on formula. I want to breastfeed him once my medication is over. Would I be able to do it once he's one to two months old? See, that's exactly what I was mentioning earlier as well. The relactating after you know a big break of breastfeeding and the baby being on formula and bottle fed. So there's two things here that I want you to address. So first of all, it's the relactating, but it's also, you know, talking about the techniques we use for bottle feeding so that baby goes easily between breast and bottle as well. I think this plays into this question as well. Yes, but I think, okay, so so I think there are three parts of this question, but uh, can you just remind me in case I start drifting off? Sure. Um, the first bit would be, to think about how oh, the four parts now, I think, off the top of my head. Um, first, you want to question whether that medication is actually not safe for breastfeeding, right? Most medications are perfectly safe when you're breastfeeding because there is a huge dilutional effect in your blood stream yeah. right so you take it orally some of it gets digested by the liver it gets into the gut um, and then a small volume of that continues to be in the bloodstream some parts of that will be in your milk supply a small amount of that will then be transferred into your baby babies will then get it into the earth system it will be digested by the liver before that little tiny minuscule amount is going to be in their bloodstream. So is it really unsafe for breastfeeding? That's number one. Number two, while you are on that medication, there is nothing stopping you from continuing to pump and continue to make that milk. Whether or not it gets into your baby is a different question, right? So we can continue to lactate but not give it to your baby. 
just so that your breasts actually continue to get that uh, stimulation so that you will be able to make that milk for your baby. Okay, yeah. so that's second part, right? And I think that's really important. So if you have then decided that you're not going to be breastfeeding for long, you still have that option or you're not going to be breastfeeding for that amount of time. You still have that option of actually collecting that breast milk and then offering it to your baby at a later time. Mm -hmm. Okay. The mom has just written in to say uh, the medication she's taking is Zopiclone. Yeah. And so it's one of she has sore breasts. So I think maybe the recommendation was also not to direct latch because of the sore nipples. Uh, and she's using... We can talk more about that. But not <laughs> twice a day. So she's using the, a pump, but not she's only pumping twice a day. So yes, if you, I mean, going back to that, to what I had mentioned, if you have sore, okay, wait, hang on. If you've got sore breasts, you need to speak with a lactation consultant. That's, that's obvious, right? Uh, it could be that the, the flanges are wrongly fitting. It could be that your baby's not latching on well. There's so many parts to this question, Johanna. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, so coming back to this, um, I, so Continuing to pump actually maintains your milk supply, and that's really important, okay? So when you come off that medication, you can then decide, all right, now I can start to have my baby back at the breast. Um, and in this case, while right. you're thinking of whatever, two pumps a day, is that going to be enough? Or how often is a mom supposed to be removing the milk and maintain her supply? Ideally, like... In the ideal world, at least eight times a day, but it might not be, um, you know, possible for a lot of mothers, especially if they don't have a lot of help. So I say usually at least six to eight times a day would be good enough. Okay. That's every four hours, it's quite doable for most mothers. And it has, oh, milk also has to be removed during those hours of 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. That's also really important because that's when the amount of prolactin in our body is surging. And mm -hmm. prolactin is prolactinogen, which is actually the manufacturer of milk in our body. So those hours are super important. We need to have at least one pump in those hours as well. Okay, that's really okay. good. But then uh, speaking of uh, coming back to the bottle feeding in a way that doesn't um, make the baby want to only get the milk from the breast because as we know it flows much more easily and babies tend to then not not to want to go back uh to direct latching yeah. what are you yeah. like? so tricky this one you know like every single bottle that i've encountered will be able to look every single bottle is going to be allowing milk to flow much faster Mm -hmm. than the breast, right? Because with the breast, the baby actually has to suckle quite intensely before the milk starts to flow. With the bottle, all the baby needs to do is to chomp down on the teat and then milk flows immediately. If the baby does that to you on the breast, you're going to go out. I'm yeah. not going to have this anymore. I'm not going to allow you to suckle, right? So it's two different mechanisms of action. So I, I wish bottle manufacturers could hear this, but of course they're not, right? But you, you know what I mean. So, of course, there are also many ways, many types of bottles that are available. Some of the teats are really sh small, narrow, right? There's some that have got really beautiful, hill-looking ones. There's some that are lopsided on one side of the teat. And there's so many out there. I usually want the nice, broad ones, right? The ones which kind of look like the breast, not with the big, bulbous-looking bits at the, at the end. Um, you know, there's so many ways to do this is a method of bottle feeding that seems to kind of allow babies to then use their mouth and their jaws and their tongues to kind of get milk, maybe mimicking as much breastfeeding as possible. And that's called paste bottle feeding. And that's where we actually, I don't have a bottle. I have my water bottle with, with <laughs> Maroka in it. Um, we want the baby to kind of like, oh, we want the milk to be half, filled in the teat and so babies actually have to suckle to be rewarded with milk 
Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So if the baby is not suckling well, they're not going to be getting that milk. And then it's like, yeah, no, we're not going to get milk at all. So they need to learn how to suckle. So it's called suck training in a way. We, I mean, I, I prefer not to use a bottle, but I'd rather use a finger and a syringe or a tube. But mm-hmm. we can talk about that at another time. Pace bottle feeding is really important though. And I think that there are yeah. lots of videos out there where this is actually explained in, in greater detail. And I think that would be worth looking into as well for, for this mommy Shweta, was it? Yeah, amazing. She's also saying, yeah. please repeat the time once again. I think she's talking about the pro, where the prolactin surges. So at what time, you, you were mentioning times where it's really important to get milk removed. And mm. when is that? 11 p.m to 3 a.m. Those are the timings where you're most tired and that's the reason why we actually produce that uh, prolactin at at those times because that's when you're actually going to be riding on that wave and that's really important Mm -hmm. if you want to maintain your milk supply. Pumping Mm -hmm. twice a day is not going to work though, hey? So we really need to start pumping a lot more frequently than that Uh if you want to maintain the supply. Yeah, and maybe just get help for the sore nipples as well. So this is Every so this is why your lactation consults are not five minutes long. This is oh. many moms come in with such complex cases. We you I think you're very holistic in looking at you know what is happening, how is the baby latching, what is happening around them at home, do they have the right support, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I can only say please, mommy, reach out to my silly and her team. Uh, because I, it, it seems that she could be a good help for you. Okay, I have another uh, next question. Ooh, a lot of questions, actually. So I will be having a C-section. What will be my ability to take medication to ease pain if I want to start breastfeeding right away? How do you balance trying to ease pain with feeding the baby? So breast uh, medication obviously needed for pain relief after C-section. Mm-hmm. Um, will that affect milk supply or will she be able to uh, breastfeed straight away? Look, if you're in pain, you need to take your painkillers because there's no real point in in like gritting your teeth. Because think about it, if you're taking, if you're pooping in the toilet, if you're in pain, it's not going to come out. So we need to be in that state where we are relaxed. You're just allowing things to flow naturally. And that has to happen. And if, if you're going to be in pain, it's not going to come out. And the milk's not going to flow at the same instance, right? Um, there is okay so I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, science here right but cortisol or adrenaline versus oxytocin you can't be in love and feel stress at the same time we want the cortisol or adrenaline to be really low down for the oxytocin to go up and oxytocin is a hormone of love ejaculation, milk ejection reflex, child birthing, like you're actually birthing your baby, that's oxytocin. So if you're in pain, please take the painkillers and most painkillers as most medications are safe in breastfeeding as well. Yeah. Okay. Which brings me to another question that we got in. I'm not going to go into the specifics. I will forward this to the mom uh, about the specific supplements that she was asking about. But where can mom find information on which um, I find the doctors often are not very clued in. So I'm not mm-hmm. talking about our gynees now. Stephanie was asking about C-section and so on. Obviously, your gynee will be very knowledgeable about the types of painkillers that they can give you um, that are compatible with breastfeeding. But I find that when we go to GPs, local clinics and whatever, they're often not very clued in on what is safe and what isn't. And they'd rather say, oh, stop taking, uh, sorry, stop breastfeeding while you're taking this medication. So do you have a resource for moms uh, where they can go and look up what is safe and what isn't? Yep. So I'm just trying to find the other link. I've already put one up there and there is this one as well, infant risk. Um, Hang on one sec. Okay. So these are two links which I put up on the chat right now. One is e-lactentia and the other one's infant risk. Infant risk is also sold as a paid app and it costs about $100. So if you're really determined to find out whether these medications are safe, um, you can use a free website, which is eLactentia, and it's actually created by a pharmacist um, who has then gone on and done quite significant amounts of research, 
Um, I do believe it's either Spanish or Mexican. I can't it's tell. Spanish. Yeah, no, no, no. Spanish. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, and it gives you a good amount of information. It tells you about the half-life of the medication and it tells you whether it's safe, whether it's not safe, and it is not safe. What are the safe alternatives to taking that medication? The infant risk is not medical. It goes down to the molecular levels uh, and, and talks about like what is unsafe about this medication. But like I said, it is a paid app and it costs about $100 to download. There are tons of forums on the infant risk um, web page the second link that i put up as well so you can try and find out on that forum uh just run a search page perhaps and find out if any of those uh, medications that you're looking at if they appear on that forum page as well okay great um i read that if you have a high if you have high levels of lipase it can make your milk go bad quickly how do i know if your milk has high levels of this enzyme it's an enzyme we don't actually need to measure it the only problem with lipase is that it makes the breast milk smell a bit fishy. But mm. do babies mind it? I actually don't think so. So lipase in breast milk is not a problem if it comes fresh from the source, right? So if you pump the milk and give it to your baby or the baby latches on and actually gets the milk right directly, not an issue. The problem comes in when babies are given milk that has been stored in the fridge or in the freezer. That's when the lipase action kicks in a bit faster and mm -hmm. there is that fishy, maybe metallic taste to the breast milk. Most babies do not mind. And if you find that the baby is a little bit sensitive to it, don't give them the, the kept milk, right? So you want to have the, the milk freshest from the source. Okay, but it's not actually dangerous for baby to consume it. It might okay. Not at all. Um, my baby is 13 months old, and for personal reasons, I will need to wean her by the time she is 16 or 17 months old. She doesn't drink milk when I offer it in a bottle or cup. So she only drinks milk when breastfeeding after daycare and all through the night. What's the best way to wean her off that? To wean her off breastfeeding, basically. Hmm. Okay. So um Weaning is a topic that I usually spend an hour talking to mothers on the various methods, strategies, because every child is different. Every mother is different. Mm -hmm. Your attachment and your relationship with your child can also vary, but there's so many ways you can do it. First of all, you might want to change the container in which the milk is offered in, right? Now, if you're removing something from a child, you need to replace it. Just like how if, you know, like, if I were to take something off you, you're going to resent me for it unless I gave you something to replace it with. So if you're removing that particular breastfeed at seven o'clock before the baby goes down for a nap, for instance, then you need to replace it with extra hugs, extra cuddles, extra book reading, extra, I don't know, whatever you can do, maybe even TV time, whatever it works, you need to replace it with something else. And that's number one. If you're reducing the amount of milk that you're giving your baby then maybe we want to talk about so this baby's 13 months did you say yeah yeah, yeah. we can offer cow's milk in a in a cup in a straw in a sippy cup any of those things as well so you don't actually need to give formula and breast milk if you're planning on reducing that amount that you're producing then we can talk about strategies to do that as well so um think about what I've said about replacing feeds with something else because I think that would be a really good strategy for you to maybe think about if it if you haven't explored that one yet mm -hmm. right okay. um, after 12 months you don't actually need to give formula you can give uh, fresh milk right um, if your baby's actually eating well and if your baby's not eating well you need to start your baby eating well from here on Okay. okay, weaning off breastfeeding, I think, is a different topic. And that would actually require you to slow down the amount of milk removal in terms of the amount of frequency and the amount of milk volume that you're producing as well. Ice packs are my best friend in this situation. So whenever your breasts are feeling full, engorged, uncomfortable, putting an ice pack, so not one of those small round thingos that you can buy mm -hmm. that cost significant amounts of money. I'm actually talking about a bag of frozen peas. Um, yeah. A big bag will cover most of the breast parenchyma and that would actually start reducing the amount of milk produced as well. So that would be another good tip for you. Amazing. Thank you. 
Um, another question is, is there a difference between dairy allergy and intolerance? So allergy versus intolerance. Mm -hmm. um, it was suggested that I cut out dairy due to slow weight gain and high number of poops. She doesn't have any blood or mucus, just poops a lot. Is there something to look for to understand if limiting the dairy is working? It's been about two weeks and I'm still seeing the same number of poop roughly. Okay. I actually think there might be something else going on here. Okay. If your baby is gassy and sharting, do you know what a shart is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So Johan and I know what a shart is, but a shart really means that your baby is farting and a small amount of poop comes along with it. That's a shart, right? Um, if your baby is gassy, sharting a lot, very hard to settle, not much weight gain, Peas tons, right? So, you know, the usual amount of peas would be six to eight wet nappies um, and maybe one to about three poos and good, nice yellow, sunshine yellow poos. Then we know that that's normal. Anything outside it and actually more on the other side. So you're producing way more wet nappies, way more poos than normal. And the baby's not gaining weight. I often think about a four milk, high milk imbalance. Mm hmm can I talk about that? It is a little bit technical. Yeah. So it really just means that, okay, so if you think about a whole set meal, we start off with an appetizer. You might have your soup and salad, and then you might have a little bit of um, uh, bread, butter, whatever, right? Then you have your pasta, you have your main course, which might be a meat, whatever. And then at the end of the meal, we have our melting chocolate lava cake. If your baby has got that much stomach capacity and you're producing that much of milk most of that stomach capacity is going to be filled with your appetizer and maybe a little bit of your pasta but mm -hmm. you're missing out on all the rest of it so you're missing out on the main course you're missing out on the melting chocolate lava cake and even the ice cream at the end of the meal so if you're only getting that front bit of it your baby is going to be putting on lots of weight because it's a lot of water proteins and the nutrients but not much of the cream at the end of the meal so maybe that would be something for you to think about are you then producing far too much milk as compared to what your baby actually needs and if that's the case we need to talk about reducing the milk supply to match your baby's demands a bit better mm -hmm. and that's interestingly a lot of what you're seeing in clinic as well we always think that you would have the moms that come in that don't have enough milk but we see a lot of oversupply and this is, I don't know, what do you attribute that to? Um, I think mothers often are worried that they're not producing enough. Yeah. And I don't know where that fear comes from. Because maybe it's maybe it's the medical professionals who, who talk about, oh, how much milk is your baby taking? And they want to quantify it for them. Uh -huh. um, everyone wants to say, oh, yeah, mommy, you're doing a good job. And so by actually producing that amount of milk, it is almost giving you a trophy or a, or a handout saying well done mama actually we don't care about that volume as a lactation consultant i care about what your baby's producing at the end of the day in terms of the wet and dirty nappies because and, and also the weight gains that's what i really want to see the output must often you know if the baby's producing a good amount of peas and poos and not overproducing and the baby's growing well that's the output that's the outcome i want to see Right, so the volumes of breast milk. Sometimes they say, "Okay, maybe that's a bit too much." Can I come back to the allergy sensitivity um, question? Yes, please, because I realize we haven't fully answered that. Yeah, right. So um, <laughs> that's just you and I, right? We just go on. <laughs> um, it's a spectrum. Having a sensitivity to an intolerance to having an allergy, a full-fledged allergy, is really just a spectrum of, of disease, right? You and I could have a lot of ice cream and then get a sore tummy and uh, might be gassy and uncomfortable for that day. That could be a uh, sensitivity, right? If I gave you ice cream and you start breaking out in hives and that sort of thing, it could be anywhere between an intolerance to a full-fledged allergy. So most people would have intolerance. You and I cannot tolerate certain things. And so that's an intolerance, right? And really, it is a spectrum. If you have completely cut out that offending agent, and in this case, it might be a cow's milk proteins, um, and you don't see any change Shame. in your baby's behavior 
then I think you can go ahead and reintroduce it again, right? Because in two weeks, we should have seen a significant change in your baby. And if you're not, then go back and have it again. No problem. Think about the next step. So what else can we do to kind of make your baby more comfortable? Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you. Um, another question and just an add on on what we discussed earlier is weaning off breastfeeding completely. What is the best strategy? Is it gradually reducing the amount of time per, per breastfeeding session or reducing the number of sessions? Both. Okay. We have to do it all in tandem. So if you can actually, so this is something for a 13 month old can be a bit tricky because they have no concept of time. Um, so then maybe even singing a song and offering a breastfeed for the duration of that length of the song, maybe sing happy birthday because 13 months, they would have celebrated their birthday just a month ago. You know, sing happy birthday five times, for instance. And, and if, once the fifth time is over, you can say, okay, now we're going to do something else, right? Um, we could also then do, I don't really like distraction as much because I feel like you're just pushing away the need, but replacing it with something else. So say, okay, we can breastfeed when we go to the room, but now we're here, let's play a game instead. Do you know what I mean? So instead of breastfeeding then at that very instant, let's say, okay, we can do it later, but let's do this first. You know, that would be another way to do it. Mm -hmm. Very hard to deal with a 13 month old because they, yeah, like I said, mm -hmm. they have no concept of time and place, but we just have to keep trying. Okay. Uh, another question from the chat earlier is, sorry, from my WhatsApp chat. Um, any recommend recommendations to combat strong bottle aversion um, or boob preference. My baby was exposed to the bottle from birth and was drinking drinking from it just fine until she turned eight weeks old. She's now coming to three months and will now simply starve herself with when she's out when the mom is out. So she only wants the breast and how to deal with that. Okay, this one is <laughs> there's so many tricky questions here. Um, okay, this one's very interesting because this baby has actually had bottles before, but now has now a strong breast preference. Look, I think babies don't just like the breast because it comes in a nice pretty package, but it's also how we give the baby the bottle. Some babies are, I mean, the bottle sometimes is really stuffed into their faces and they are not giving consent to it, right? And... And, and sometimes we shove it into their mouths, we force them to take it, and they cry it right, right through the feed. And moms get exasperated, and the babies get frustrated, and it just doesn't look nice. And that would be a perfect recipe for us not wanting to go back onto it again. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Right? So I think what we want to do is we want to introduce it like a game, right? So you can have a breastfeed first, and then, hey, look, this is this is a bottle. Let's see what it can do. And then we offer it, let the baby look at it, let the baby hold it, let the baby try it in their mouth. And we sing a song and make it fun, make it enjoyable. If it still doesn't work, then you might need to try something else. A, a different way of offering food to a baby at eight weeks old can be a bit tricky, but you know, that these are things that we can do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, mummies, keep the questions coming. We've got another 15 minutes, I think, um, on the on the call. Um, supplements. Um, oh, I have asked all my questions. Oh, wow. Um, this is the first. <laughs> no. Mummies, is there anyone on the call who would like to speak to my CV directly? Um, okay. Another, let's talk, can we talk about uh, low milk supply? Um, because we've mentioned the oversupply just now. How do I know that I have low supply? How can I get it up? Um, talking a little bit about that. Absolutely. So a low milk supply is very contentious. Like, why do you think you have a low milk supply? Do you find that this is going to be a baby who is not growing, not peeing, not pooing? Is that a baby? We, then we have evidence. Is that, is that the problem? So, okay, let me put it this way. 
There's so many. Okay. It could be a baby problem. If your baby is not latching on well, not being able to transfer milk because there's a mouth anatomy issue, maybe the baby has a, a torticollis and is not able to get onto the breast really well. Maybe the baby has got pain in the back or, you know, on the bum or something because of the birthing methods. Um, and that's distracting your baby from, from feeding. Is your baby a very sleepy baby? So they're baby factors. And then they're mummy factors. Is the mummy's breast, you know, has she had, had implants before? Has the mummy had a significant amount of medications or a medical problem that might be affecting how the mother is then producing breast milk? Um, you know, things like that. It could be a mummy factor. But then you also have an environmental factor. Is the baby a busy baby who is then being passed around to relatives for the entire two weeks or being shushed back to sleep every time the baby wakes up hungry? Or is the baby being swaddled all the time? Because a swaddle then mimics a baby being back in the womb again. And a baby in the womb is not going to be fed in any other way besides the umbilical cord. So when a baby is swaddled, the expectation is that the baby is going to be fed by the umbilical cord and not asking for food. So there's so many factors here. And I think we really need to kind of explore each one of these factors and see what is the problem here. And is the mom actually removing milk regularly? Mm -hmm. um, and is there a problem with the baby? Is there a problem with the environment? And then we try and solve it that way. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, question. Keeping baby on only formula, will that impact baby's growth and development? Mm. Well, <laughs> I must say, uh, probably no, but your baby might be missing out on important bits for the growth and development that is available on breast milk only. Um, formula is made to mimic breast milk as much as science and technology is able to yeah. but there are tons of things in breast milk I can't even say what they are because we don't know There's a, it's, it's a vast amount of things in breast milk that we cannot mimic and we cannot copy and put in formula because it will not stay for instance we have got um, immunoglobulins which are your responses to your environment so for instance if your neighbor has a big sneeze and little particles in your in your neighbor's big sneeze gets into your house your body then processes those ones to make antibodies and some of those antibodies are then going to be transported into your baby via breast milk if your baby has been carried by someone, for instance, and, you know, that that person had some kind of infection or something that's going on in her body, that baby will then communicate that information through her saliva. And when the mom and the baby is then latched onto the breast, will then transfer that information through the breast, through the areola. And then the mom is going to be making her response, her immune response to those bugs or whatever they are back into the baby i mean it's like an incredibly complex network of making sure that the baby is going to be covered for all potential infections inflammation whatnot diseases so yeah. can a bottle of formula mimic that i'm not sure and probably no but the other thing, the other aspect is it's not just about what's in the breast milk versus formula, but it is also um, that oral facial development as well. Mm. A breastfed baby's mouth or even the whole skull develops in a different way than a breastfed, uh, sorry, a bottle fed baby. And I encourage this mom to watch the talk we had in, I think in November with Dr. Sarinda Aurora, where we talked about um, just that. She's a pediatric dentist and talked a little bit about how important breastfeeding is for the full development of, um, of everything around the mouth and the jaw and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. um, do I need to be concerned if my baby has been feeding hourly overnight for more than a month? Um. Do you need to be concerned? 
does it concern you? I mean, I'm guessing it does concern you, Terry. Uh, and if it does concern you, then come and, and have a chat, right? Because there could be something in the baby. I don't even know how old this baby is, right? Um, but we need to find out what is going on. Why is this baby feeding so frequently? And is there something that we need to address quickly? And I think if you're concerned about it, come in and let's have a chat about this, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, should we make an appointment for a lactation consult uh, to learn how to use a breast pump properly? That's a good uh, question. Mm. Mom is, uh, still pregnant. Still pregnant. Okay. Um, if you're still pregnant, then I would suggest maybe let's keep it for when your baby arrives. I Look, breast pumps are important in the breastfeeding journey, but they're not a must-have for most moms mm -hmm. unless there is a planned separation. If there is a planned separation, then yes, you need a breast pump because you need to continuously con make milk and produce milk so that when your baby's back on your chest, the baby will be able to get some breast milk out of there. But you don't need a breast pump while you're pregnant and you don't need a breast pump in the early days. We live in Singapore, which really means that you can get a breast pump, you can get a good breast pump within a day, right? Usually within a day, you should be able to get one. Or if it's a weekend, within two days, right? Um, yes, you may need to speak with a well-informed lactation consultant who will then be able to size you for the funnel sizes because, you know, sometimes the funnels that you get like are that big and it yeah. really shouldn't be. The final sizes will only require the nipple to be moving in and out of the funnel, right? So any more than just the nipple, it might be a bit too big. And if your nipples are rubbing by the sides, it may be a bit too small. But again, I think it's worth having a look at in action. So bring your breast pump, bring the funnels along, and then we can uh, determine this. In pregnancy, nipple sizes can change. And yeah. sometimes when you have a baby that comes out of you and then starts suckling, the nipple size can also change. So maybe not so important to get a breast pump this early. Yeah. Very long uh, answer for a short question. Oh, I know, I know. But this also brings me to, you know, in a lot of moms um, might think, that, oh, a lot of moms spend a lot of time learning about birth. They spend a lot of time writing birth plans and discussing that with their providers. And I sort of love that this mom is, you know, thinking about it early on. And often I th I think breastfeeding plan, <laughs> why, why don't we make that? As in, as you said earlier, some moms don't have a requirement for a breast pump. Others do because they're going back to work soon. So having a plan in place and thinking about the logistics of all of that and how to set yourself up with and with the help of a lactation consultant can be a really good thing to do because we're all different, aren't we? We all have different requirements. Is using a pacifier okay for a few minutes, say 15 minutes total a day? What are your thoughts on pacifiers? Uh, depends on why the baby's been given a pacifier. Is it really necessary? Can you allow the baby to suckle for a few minutes instead? Um, can you maybe think about why the baby needs a pacifier? Like, why does the baby have a sucking need at that point in time? Um, I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of, on pacifiers, to be honest, because I find that it is an infection risk, number one. It does cause um, a different kind of a mouth gape. It doesn't allow the baby to actually get any nutrients anyway. I mean, you think about it, you're, you're just suckling for, for nothing, right? At least if the baby's given a bottle or a breast, there is some kind of nutrient exchange in there, but not with a pacifier. Mm -hmm. I find that sometimes when babies are given pacifiers, they do tend to speak a little bit later. Um, because they feel, I mean, maybe, maybe, baby psychology, right? But um, you know, every time the baby cries, you're giving a pacifier that really just shuts them up, like plugs the gap, really. Um, but it, it depends. I mean, every mom, every baby, every situation is a little bit different. And if there is a serious need for a pacifier, go ahead and use it. Um, but think through it. Like, what is the point of it? Why are we doing this? Yeah. Okay. And then a very quick one. Oh, we're already at the end. But, <laughs> um, moms um, are often worried about the shape of their breasts, about their nipples in particular. Inverted nipples is something that often mm. being told, oh, you won't be able to breastfeed. Is that true? 
Inverted nipples can evert with time. So some moms with an inverted nipple, to be honest, you don't nipple really breastfeed. So you really actually don't need that nipple to be sticking out to breastfeed. But for some mothers, for babies, look, it's it's really a puzzle piece. If the baby has got a really good latch, really good thumb, nicely cups the breast and not, no issues with that, then fine, you don't even have an issue. If the baby has a little bit of a thumb restriction, and the mom has got a very fibrous nipple with an inverted nipple, then we might run into some problems here. But this is the kind of case where presentation consult is super important for us to talk about all the other vari variations. What are the possibilities? What can we do now to make sure that the breastfeeding journey goes according to plan? Amazing. So pre-lactation consult super important. Okay, amazing. This is the end of our... <laughs> morning today it was so lovely to have you as always thank you all mum all your mummies for joining us and for your excellent questions really loved uh talking you to you this morning and we'll see you all uh next week if you want to sign up for an aqua fitness class with alicia of the ripple club we still have some spots left so do drop us a message and we'd love to see you there thank you my silly and we'll share all your contact details, obviously, under the video as well. And I'll share the resources that you gave us, the infant risk and the lactancia as well. Okay, thank you oh. for joining us this morning and have a lovely day. Bye. Take care, guys. Bye.